Welcome back to the table and our last session on Paul's letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, the last letter that Paul writes. He's at the end of his life. We have talked about this several times. He is going through a trial. He is probably gonna be convicted and executed. And now we're down to the last few final sentences that he writes. Let's back up just a little bit and let's begin by looking at about verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. That's kind of the sentence that puts the last portion of this letter in perspective. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read from verse 18 to the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Ebulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Paul's final greetings have a air of sentimentality about them, especially when you read the line where he says, do your best to get here before winter. Why is that in there? Is he cold? Does he need a cloak? Possibly. But the reality is that once winter hit, the ships would not sail. They wouldn't get out on the ocean with bad weather, cold weather, wind, ice. So if Timothy did not get there before winter, Timothy would not get there before Paul was executed. Paul wants to see his best friend. Paul wants to see the young man that he poured his heart and his life into. Paul wants to see the one he's been mentoring, the one he's gonna turn the ministry over to. He wants to see him one more time. That's the heart of Paul. And it's kind of unique that Paul, who is this A-type personality, this driven, this doer, this get things done, this is the guy who was climbing the social ladder and climbing the career ladder before he came to Christ. And with that same motivation, with that same energy, he is now serving Christ. But yet he realizes how important people are. As a matter of fact, as you go through the last part of Paul's letter, from various uh, verses to the end of the letter, let's look at some of the people he mentions. Luke, Crescens, Titus, Mark, Tychicus, Carpus, Alexander the coppersmith, who did him some harm, but he said, don't worry about it, God will take care of him. And then the ones we lifted, Priscilla and Aquila, Onesiphorus, Erastus, Trophimus, Ebulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. There are some people at Christian Fellowship and every church who do some wonderful things but get very little recognition. As you read through this list, we don't know the names of most of these people. Some were listed in Acts, some we see in other places, but sometimes we don't know anything about these people. But they served the Lord faithfully, they helped build the kingdom, they worked and served with Paul. And Paul says they deserve some recognition. One of the things I'd like for you to do is this coming Sunday, some of the people who serve their Christian fellowship, and maybe it's just not a, a, a big glamorous ministry that they're a part of, but they just do something that's really important. Say, for example, when was the last time you thanked the nursery workers and children's church workers for the job they are doing? There are people who are helped building the ministry, the people who sit back there in that sound booth Sunday after Sunday. When was the last time you told them, you guys are doing a great job? This is what Paul is doing. He He's giving recognition to some people who faithfully served week in, week out. We've got their names, but that's about all we know about them. Some of these we'll never know until we get to heaven. But one, the first lesson, thank the people who serve. Be kind to them, be gracious to them, and let them know how much they are appreciated. One of the things I find interesting in this last portion is when he rushed to Trophimus, I left sick in Miletus. Paul has prayed for numerous people who have been miraculously healed. Jesus prayed for people who were miraculously healed. I believe divine healing, that God heals sick bodies, is for us today. I believe we find that healing in the atonement that Christ purchased for us on Calvary. When you read in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said, by his stripes, his referring to Jesus, by his stripes we are healed. Peter repeats that in the New Testament. So I believe there is a, a divine way, a divine path, biblical pattern for there to be healing in our bodies. It's appropriate for us to pray for people who are sick. sick. James said, 
in his book, Is There Any Sick Among You? Let them call for the elders of the church, anointing them with all, and the prayer of faith will raise them up. So we can pray for sick people, and we should, and they're going to be healed. But not everyone is healed. We know that. We've experienced that. I've experienced it in my own life. Matter of fact, Paul himself had something he called a thorn. Now, it wasn't a physical thorn like off a rose bush. It was just something that aggravated him. And the, he says, I prayed three times for it to be removed, and it wasn't removed. Uh, we, we know this instance here with Trophimus that he left him sick. Now, we don't know that he was never healed. We just know at this point in time he was sick and the prayers didn't lift him up. Paul's protege, Timothy, he tells Timothy, you got to take a little wine every now and then because you got a stomach problem. So just because there are issues that don't get healed doesn't mean that God does not heal. I thoroughly believe that this book tells us there is healing for our sick bodies. And it's appropriate for you and I to pray for people. Leave the healing in God's hands. But I think it's appropriate for us to, apply, to approach the throne of God and know that God can heal our sick bodies and he can still perform miracles. As we get to the end of Paul's letter, there's another thing I want us to, to, to draw on one last point in all of this. And he talks about in the verse that I read to begin with, the people have left me, but I don't hold this against them. He talks about Alexander the coppersmith did great harm, but the Lord's going to take care of him. The Lord's going to do that. Last lesson that we look at in this life of Paul as he writes to Timothy, it's not worth it to hold a grudge. As we go through life in this world, there are going to be people who offend us. There's going to be people who hurt us. There are going to be people who intentionally do something to aggravate or frustrate, and that frustrate us. And there are going to be some who are intentionally going to do something. They didn't even know they hurt us or offended our feelings. First of all, we just have to grow up and understand offenses happen in this world. And we have to also understand that it is not worth it to hold a grudge. Even for the people who did us harm, let it go. God will take care of it. We go on about our way, serving God, faithfully worshiping him every day. God is a good accountant. God keeps good records. If you have been uh, harmed, if you have been hurt, if there is something that there needs to be rectified, God will do that. Let him take care of that. Let God. God will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let him do it. You and I just continue to walk in the love of Christ and understand and try to put ourselves in the sandals of Paul. As he is nearing the end of his life, he's just saying, I don't hate anybody, and I don't want anybody to hate me, and I want all of these people, even those who deserted me, I want them to know that I love them and I care about them. So this is some of the takeaways that we get from this wonderful letter that we got to step inside the heart and mind of Paul, his last letter, how emotional it was for him to write, I've kept the faith, I've fought the good fight, all these things that come into this heart and mind and spirit of this man we know as Paul. I've enjoyed being a part of this table with you, and on behalf of the other staff who have shared with you and the group discussions we have had, we appreciate you so much turning in. The next session we do on the table is not going to be out of Book of the Bible. We're going to come back as staff members again, and we are going to talk about making prayer a consistent, vital part of your life. It's probably one of the most important things in our Christian life, and it's probably one of the most neglected things because it's just a little bit of a struggle. We're going to give you practical lessons on prayer. So tune in to the table next week as we start that journey. God bless you. Have a great day.